Everybody listen to We Are Not Wizards. Because we are the best. And we're not wizards. No matter what anybody says. Goodbye. <laughs>
that's quite a lot. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, but maybe if we're both obsessed with producing stuff, if you're producing games and producing content, then maybe we're kind of in the best kind of the best kind of company. Are you the type of person that kind of are you actively involved in the hobby yourself then? Do you play quite a lot of board games, tabletop yourself? Yeah, we uh every Friday we get together at a friend's house. He's got I don't know, he's got thirteen, fourteen hundred board games at his house. So we pretty much get together every Friday for the most part and play games and then different group of friends on Thursdays occasionally we'll either play games or we'll get together to do some beta testing of the stuff I'm actively mm-hmm. creating because we've got the Robotech stuff we're doing. We've like I said, we've got Invid Invasion coming out. Later this year, and then we're actually actively working on the development of a deck, bu- a Robotech based deck builder. Hopefully, that if we renew the license next year, we'll get that out next year. Just with somebody that has, like, say, fourteen hundred games, how do you even begin to decide what to play? <laughs> we mean, generally must- uh, <laughs> we we play whatever the latest thing that showed up at his house is for the most part. Like last week, we played Wingspan. Um, wow. so there are certain games that I won't play with those friends and there are certain games they won't play with me um, just because we we all have our strengths so we try not to play play things we can face pound e- the, each other with at, t- at the table so are you quite competitive um I, I like to win I don't I don't <laughs> win at all costs but if you put a game with a decent uh, exploitable <laughs> economic engine in front of me I'm gonna run you around the table so that's a yes then <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind losing so much but I do like winning that's still a yes Dave <laughs> <laughs> but I mean is that your kind of, I mean is that your kind of bag then are you like into your kind of like your engine building games do you like you know you like your size of this world and things like that where you can you know you can put in like a block of wood on one side and you you know, you can kind of produce an entire village out the other once it's gone through all the kind of the various conniptions and connotations and kind of transformations that kind of kind of go through that. The uh, so for me, like one of my favorite, my favorite, one of my favorite things to play is a deck builder. I, I really like the mm-hmm. idea because you're you're building an engine with cards. But uh, from an economic standpoint, like they won't play Raj of the Ganges with me anymore. Because I'll I'll run I run away with it and and it doesn't have a it doesn't have a catch up or a slowdown mechanic so the only way to slow me down is for them to play suboptimally which is kind of self defeating so stuff yeah. like that where anything where I can if anything where I can figure out how to make a lot of money in a hurry I see terraforming Mars I'm pretty good at too so it's if you can if I can find a way to you know in games where money's involved money if money is the king then I will mm. generate as much money as humanly possibly I can, and then I will invest that money to make even more money, and then you can't catch me. So, do, you yeah. play, do you play Star Realms online? Oh, yeah. I, 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 not online, but I, I'll play Star Realms. I like, I like a lot of the new expansions they did. We used to play a lot of Star Realms um, with mm-hmm. the actual cards. Uh, I was playing it on my phone for a long time, and then when I changed phones, it didn't save all my progress, which kind of upset me, so I quit playing oh. it. I play, I play a lot of Ascension on my phone. All right, that's a shame because if you had Star Realms, I would have challenged you to a match. <laughs> this is me taking my leather glove and slapping you across the face in some kind of you oldie worldy. Take that, sir, you hack. There you, there um, you go. There you go. <laughs> that's it. I don't know what you do in Texas. Don't care. A couple of thousand miles away, you can't touch me. Yeah, um, there you but go. anyway, <laughs> so, but. I mean, with you having access to that many games, do you generally keep a smaller collection of games yourself? I can't see much point in you having like several hundred games yourself. No, I, I, I tend to, if I invest stuff. in a Kickstarter, I usually take it over mm-hmm. to his house and add it to his collection. I mean, I have, we have, oh. we have, we have every DC deck builder expansion ever made. They're like, we're looking forward to the new rebirth because they've really modified. I saw them at Gamma. They've really put out a yeah. new set of mechanics for that that's really good. And then we, um, you know, miscellaneous things like small stuff we can play with friends who aren't nerdy board gamers that that uh-huh. they they recognize. Um, I refuse to own um, Cards Against Humanity, but the the stuff like Small World and some of those you know, Seven Wonders, that kind of stuff, we we keep that stuff around so we can play with normals. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you mean people that haven't fully experienced in the joys of playing board games yet can't call yeah, them normals. Do. 
pe- people who might be confused by something like Roll for the Galaxy or Galaxy Trucker or stu- or uh, Twilight Imperium, for that matter. Yeah, Galaxy Trucker is not the easiest game. I mean, this is not an accessible game. I mean, something where the first thing is you have an open fight to decide which components you have. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. Know, it's not, I mean, that is usually two-thirds into a game of Monopoly. I mean, this is not something that happens at the beginning. I've never played Twilight Imperium. That's because um, I don't think I've done anything that wrong to play it. <laughs> and I also never, ever have a spare. Can, can, you know, if I had 10 hours to do to kill... You know, I'm pretty sure there'd be stuff I could be doing something else. I play a little bit of board game, but there's other things I could I'd probably well, be there's, podcasting. There's, there's, there's always a Arkham Horror or Firefly with all the expansions too. <laughs> but that, yeah, no. it, it takes up like half a. It's like half a house, you know. And this yeah, is my that's house. That's something that like we'll, we plan. We'll plan something like that like twice a year. We'll do something big and involved like that. We'll have people over the house and then do food and everything, and then kind of play all day. Do you play? Have you played Eclipse? No, I haven't played that one yet. I've heard it's kind of like a slim down. It's kind of like a slim down kind of Twilight Imperium. It's apparently quite elegant. I was just speaking to somebody else, and they said they liked it. So I don't know. I'm kind of like I like to be able to. I like an epic game, but I don't necessarily want it to take an epic kind of Ben Hur times three type time kind of thing. I like to be able to kind of be able to. I guess get up and not have lost the power of my legs when I get up from the chair <laughs> after I play the you, game. You know, you could you'd probably like the uh, the Invid Invasion, the Robotech Invid Invasion we're going to put out later this year. It's actually a one to six player full co op, but we actually were able to figure out a way to build mechanics so it really literally feels like you and your Scott Bernard with the five other Freedom Fighters trying to uh, remove the Invid from Reflex Point and uh, defeat the Regis before she defeats you. It's it's got a it's nice. It's got a really epic feel to it in under two and a half hours. So that was one of the things we 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 did want to do after the first two games in the series was something that had a nice epic feel where you felt like you were really there, like in the cartoon. Versus, I I was describing it to some people at Gamma when we were there. Was I got the license for Robotech and I built games to be Robotech, not game ideas I already had where I rubbed Robotech all over them. Yeah, I've seen, I mean, I mean, you don't want to, if you get a license, you don't want to kind of, it's like the whole Monopoly thing. <laughs> it's kind of like, yeah, the only time I've actually seen a decent kind of use of a license on Monopoly was Monopoly Gamer with the Mario license where they seemed to have actually decided they were going to do something with the IP. But, how for people okay let's scale it back a bit for people who aren't aware of robotech and you're just like well there's nobody that's not aware of robotech robotech is life but what's robotech about for so, people that haven't heard of it but I told you what we're so from my perspective uh robotech was an anime that came out in the mid 80s it came over um was brought to the us by harmony gold um and early in 1985 it started showing up on tv and as you know a 14 year old boy i was like this is literally the most amazing cartoon i've ever seen in my entire life because it had a very, you know, it's a little dated looking at times now, even even the, 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 the protoculture versions where they've really remastered them nicely. But it's, you know, but in 1985, you know, we were still watching stuff that was like Scooby-Doo and Hanna-Barbera and Warner Brothers. And, and, and it was just, this was, you know, planes that turned into, you know, robots and half robots and a giant battle fortress that then transforms and, looks sort of like a robot and punches other spaceships with its aircraft carrier arms. And you're like, this is amazing. And in a lot of ways, it was a gateway for anime into the U S I mean, there's a lot, there's, there's been other stuff, but it's, it's one of the most memorable from that time, you know, it led yeah. to you know, things like silver Hawks and Jason real warriors and all those, you know, I remember, Jason um, Wars. I remember ba- battle of the planets. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah. Gotcha man. That's what they call it <laughs> over there. Yeah, yeah. I was, I've actually been trying to chase that license down because I've got an idea for that, but they're a little hard to get a hold of. And then Voltron and then all that stuff that came came after. It's, uh, you know, for me, it was just, it was an introduction to this new world of animation, you know, characters, 
you know, struggle and, and real, you know, there's a lot of re- realism to it in the, and the concept that female characters could be strong and powerful, you know, the whole bridge crew, except the captain are, are women, you know, as mm-hmm. is, is, is Claudia and, and, you know, and I, I loved Lisa Hayes. I thought she was one of the most amazing characters I'd ever seen. So, you know, it just, it was something I became hooked on. And when, you know, when, when we came up, with the idea of we should get a light, you know, after doing eight board games, we're like, you know, we should look into getting a license, find something we can work with. And one of the guys who works for me at my work had brought in an old pack of, uh, 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 Robotech trading cards. And I was like, Oh my God. And went out and, and chased the license down. And the, now I, you know, this cartoon in this world that I have, I've loved for what now 34 years is something I'm at. I'm actually adding to, I'm part of, I'm, a, I'm adding art and concepts and, and ideas to a universe that's existed for so long, but I get to be, you know, I get to be a minor architect in it now, which is awesome. Is that, I mean, is that not like kind of like, you, where'd you go after that? I mean, in terms of life goals. I mean, you've scratched that one off. I mean, is there anything <laughs> else that you can kind of do? Um, I mean, because I know I know of designers that, you know, there's designers that want to do certain things, and one of them say, like, look, I just want this thing published. I want to run a successful Kickstarter. Some of them say, I'd like to get published by, you know, I'd like to work with, like, John Gilmore, or I'd like to work with Jamie Stegmaier, or, you know, folk like that. And then as like yourself, you've like you've essentially taken like a childhood license, which you absolutely obviously adore. And you've you're doing something kinda kinda with it. So um is is the idea to continue, you know, doing this until Robotech turn around and go, enough, Dave. <laughs> That's enough. Well, we've got you know, for me uh... Honestly, the the concept of making games for me is it's about taking these weird ideas that I have and turning them into something that I you know I, I joke with people. I have this special gi- uh, gift, I guess if you want to call it. It's going to sound weird when I say it that way, but like when I start concepting game ideas, I can actually build the game engine in my head and visualize how it functions. And what I do is as I play games. I get these ideas or these inspirations of what, what if we mashed this mechanic with this mechanic and this mechanic and mm-hmm. how could we make that something fun? Because I play this game and I like 50% of its mechanics. I play this game. And I like 25% of its mechanics. How do I take these pieces and assemble them into, into a concept? And, and so I like just, I get these ideas. And the thing is, is from, for my career, my job, I work in, you know, data software support. I lead a giant software support team. So my job every day is data and analysis and customer service and all these things. This is my form of art. So doing it while manufacturing is stressful and funding it is stressful and, <coughs> pardon me, running a business is stressful. Mm-hmm. The part of actually doing creation and then having people come up to you to a convention and say, Oh, I own, you know, I own Nightmare Forest Dead Run. My kids and I love to play that or Nightmare Forest Alien Invasion. And it's the it's the most fun co-op I've ever played. This is great, Dave. We love what you're doing. Please keep making more. That's the fun part. That's the part that's that's enjoyable. So, yeah, I've got these ideas like for the deck builder for Robotech we hope to make. We actually found a way to add a mechanic to a deck builder that nobody's ever done. And it's Mm -hmm. really neat. It's really cool. So it's that idea of trying to find ground to break that nobody else has. You know, I've, I've talked to Jamie several times. I I, I didn't get to work with him, but he, he used to talk back in the day before he was so busy. We used to talk on the phone every now and then about a couple of the early games we were working on and, you know, people like that. And I guess the one thing I told a friend, what I'd really like to do is have someday just have, you know, my games are successful, but I'd like to have one of those that's that big crazy hit that everybody talks about just because it would be, it would be fun because if you have something that's that big and people talk about you, they'll go back and look at the past library of things I've made and it'll help propagate those, that fun to even more people. And that's really what I want. Hmm. Is there a danger though of, there being the kind of the flash in the pan though because me being of you know being involved in the industry the level i am yeah i'll see kickstarts kind of come and go and get funded and then you'll never hear them again and is it too 
sometimes I see games like you know they'll they'll arrive and everybody will say they're the best thing ever and then they'll disappear <laughs> and you'll very rarely can you hear from them. You know, very rarely can you hear from them again. I mean, it's really weird that I've you know everybody's talking about wingspan at the moment, but there are already people that are talking about well when's when's that going to disappear? You know, mm-hmm. when, when you know, how long is this going? Is this going to be two months? Is this going to be a six months thing? Is it going to be kind of people that are going to be kind of kind of interested? So it's just it's kind of I I don't know. I always say I always put myself in third place kind of thing. I'd like to be the guy that's third place. It's kind of like known, and people kind of continually kind of buy the game, and it kind of ticks along, and people are interested, and I'm continually like to kind of have people kind of um, buy the buy the product from me. You know, not getting the kind of the big, huge, mega success, and then disappear off into the sunset with absolutely kind of kind of nothing. But you know, as I say, it it depends. I mean, the the industry's still growing and it's still evolving, and we're still kind of finding our feet. And it's an interesting time where games like Wingspan can sit alongside like the Batman game, yeah. You know, or Claustrophobia or whatever. You know, and we get games like Heroes of Land, say, uh, Heroes of uh, Land, Air and Sea, set mm-hmm. next to Root. You know, we get so many kind of different games. Well, and it's just is- like I have a my I'm I'm good friends with Edo Baraf and the oh, their, yeah. their game Herbaceous. You know, it, when you originally would have seen the concept, you'd have been like, okay, that's kind of interesting, but it's it took on this life and it, it, it you know blew up on him. You know, he's worked with he worked with several people to get it out. You know, but it's yeah. become something people like to play at tea, tea parties and stuff like that. I mean, there's. What's becoming, what I see is the, I call it the denerdification of playing board games. And as much as I find Cards Against Humanity not, you know, I'll well, have this argument, we have a philosophical argument about this all the time. It's not a game in the way that, say, playing Twilight Imperium or uh, Arkham Horror or any of those kind of games is, is, a, is a game to people who design games, but to people who may not have ever wanted to try a card or board game, it gets them in. So that's it's, it has yeah. its it has its place. It's, it's important. But I, I would my I heard somebody say this the other day. I kind of agree with it. Is the board game industry uh, as it's growing since there's so many choices has become a use and dispose industry because yeah. there's p- people listening. There's there's probably hundreds of people who have bought a game played it once or twice and then they'll either give it away or it sits on a shelf and um you know sh- you know with the whole concept of shelfies there's you know people kind of hoard their games now you know and you know i played wingspan i really enjoyed it i you know it had an economic engine in it and i nobody's you know <laughs> I, well i i mean <laughs> it, i think i won like 97 points next closest person had 67 so it was, you know, it's 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 got some exploitable mechanics in it, and it's just one of those things. It's pretty, it's interesting, it's different, yeah. and it's 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 going to be like that meme until the next pretty and interesting and different thing walks past, and yeah. we're just we're all looking for that next fix. What's the thing that really hits my you know my sweet spot that I enjoy? Like for me, you can throw any of the DC deck builders down in front of me, and I will play that over and over and over and over and over because I enjoy the system. I enjoy how Cryptozoic built what they did. Whereas if you put Marvel in front of me, it's, I'd be really picky about which version, which Marvel legendary I'm going to play because I don't like the mechanics in it as much. So it's, yeah. What it is, is you have such a broad base of people who you have with a board games. To me, you have theme, you have function and you have play. And yeah. those three things you know, Pete, each, any one of those three things can appeal to a person in a game, but not necessarily all three. So you're almost like, you know, it's almost like the game industry is, is your is your drug dealer to a degree. You're looking for the perfect fix. You're looking for the thing that touches all three points. And so we'll keep sampling things until you find the ones that, that really give you joy. You're like, for me, a part of what I keep doing with my games is tr- I, you know, I've got a good fan base. You know, we're not selling, you know, 20,000, 30,000 copies of a game, but we're selling enough that when people hear who we are at a convention, they go, oh, yeah, I've got this or I've got yeah. that. I really enjoy yeah. it. I play with yeah. my kids because Solar Flare was always built around getting families to sit down and play games together versus catering to just gamers. Yeah. Is that why, I mean, is that why your back catalog, you've got like your Lords of Rock and your Nightmare Forest and games like that, just kind of like, they look kind of the the mosh pit 
things like that, you know, your simple, they seem kind of, well, they're not breaking the bank, first of all, in terms of the price, you know. Right. Um, well, we, we wanted to, like I said, when we did the, so I've has, did I've done six Kickstarters and generated eight games from it. And hmm. like Mosh Pit was literally, I was making Lords of Rock, you know, publishing it. And I had... 11 empty card spots on a sheet of cards since I have to print at least X number of cards because you're doing full sheets at the manufacturer. And I said, yeah, yeah with a friend of mine and said, Hey, can we invent a game that takes 10 cards? And so we did. <laughs> and so we just threw it out there. It was a light little fun, silly little thing. And, but people, there's people who like it. There's people who hate it just like every other yeah. game. Um, but all of our stuff. Yeah. The, the most sophisticated thing we had out up until the Robotech stuff was the nightmare forest alien invasion, because what we did was we did Dead Run, which was an every person for themselves game where we took zombies, but we made all the animals in the forest zombies instead of people zombies, so it wouldn't be scary to children. And then we, when we did Alien Invasion, I have a I have real heartache with companies who take the exact same game, put di- different pictures on it, and call it a new game. So I refused to do that. And so we took some of the mechanics that were functional and the math we knew was functional for from Dead Run. And then made instead of making an every person for himself game, we made a full co-op game using the same connected universe. So Nightmare Forest is about, not about a, necessarily a game system; it's about a universe that the games exist in um, mm-hmm. that's connected. But it's a whole totally different standalone game, and 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 so all of these things are meant to be, you know, these little boxes that are, you know, I mean the. the Alien Invasion weighs almost a little over a pound and a half in an eight by five by one and a half box. It's a small box, $30. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. any family can pick that up without a lot of risk. And since it goes up to six players, a, a, a reasonably good sized family can sit down, play it in under an hour while dinner's cooking or right after dinner. And it it's not long. It's not super complex. It's easy to set up, easy to tear down. And that was the whole goal was, was finding that sweet spot of family fun in under an hour and so that's where we you know that's what we've even our robotech games are under an hour until we get to invent invasion would you like a game like edo has like the herbaceous type thing something that's just kind of like ticking away and breaking down the barriers and is one of these things that's getting you know it's it's getting every people that play it i've got it i mean Mm-hmm. When I play it, I like it because it is just, it's very elegant, very simple to play. And I can put it mm-hmm. in front of my mum and say, let's play a game. And she gets it within kind of five minutes. <laughs> Would you like that type of game to be part, you know, within your kind of portfolio? Or, yeah, are, I, I, are, I, I, you know? I, we've got, you know, I have seven or eight games that are partially designed that I haven't got to yet. And yeah, it's, mm. it's about, um, you know, there's one we're working on called Dog Day Afternoon, and it's it's a worker placement, but it's it's a light. You know how you say light and elegant. It's a it's a work. You know, the thought of putting a non gamer person in front of a worker placement always is kind of scary. But we 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 jokingly refer to it code name as my first worker placement because it's designed in a way to be light and elegant, like you said, so anybody can learn to mm-hmm. play it without the terror of. I've got these seven meeples. What do I do with them? You know? And so, yeah, I would love to have a, we try really hard to keep like, we're working on a game for next year. That's literally a high, a light card and dice hybrid of D and D with choose your own adventure. So it, it, it just always doing something different. It's always about finding something a little different to do the next time. So yeah, I would love to have something like that where people, sit and have reverent conversations about something you've created because as what I consider myself as more of an artist than a quote game designer is, yeah. you know, you love to have people sit around and talk about your art because it's, it's cool. It's fun. Yeah. You've given, yeah. you've given them something pleasurable in their mind and to talk about. Yeah. It's one of my aims to have people talk about this podcast. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, do you see Edo quite a bit then? I mean, he's a. I was just in Reno with him all week at Gamma. We, uh, yeah, he he tends to do like reviews of my games. He he liked the first Robotech game. Yeah. We showed him the the second one. We were that's in production right now, and he liked how we evolved it. But uh, and then we talk we talk pretty often. I don't I don't see him a lot. I usually see him about yeah. two conventions a year. But yeah. uh, 
great guy. His 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 YouTube channel is great, and his games are really good. The the, the he's got one coming out that's uh, called Heroes Welcome. It's just a slick idea. It's cool. You know, you're trying to fleece the adventurers back from the dungeon of all their gold. I mean, that's fun. That yeah. just describing it that way is fun. Yeah, yeah. He seems to pick these kind of. Um, he seems to have a good portfolio of games, which. Um, I mean, you've got things like Sunset Over Water, but then you've got, um, you know, you've got, his, you know, he's got a, kind of like a, a nice little range of games that aren't all kind of pigeonholed into one place. It's like uh, Get Me Off This, pl- uh, Lift Off, Get Me Off This Planet as well, mm-hmm. which is still a, f- a massive firm favourite of mine. You know, I love it to bits. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, you know, just part of it. The, 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 is he growing his hair again? Because I'm pretty sure I saw a picture that he had cut his hair off. And the last time he was on the show, um, which he was talking about, um, I think he'd just been talking about Herbaceous, actually. That's how long ago it was. We did spend 20 minutes talking about Edo's hair care, um, <laughs> which was an entire section. He is still is it- sporting the, the trim to cut. He's still, he's still sporting it kind of kind of short and it's not – Short, short, but it's not. He's not definitely not growing the, the big ponytail out right now. I think I need a moment to kind of deal with this, but I'll <laughs> I'll put I'll kind of power through because he was giving some very very and a man who is, you know, who's definitely suffering in both the humor and hair department. That makes two um, of us. You know, I, I kind of looked up to him as, as somebody who you know he's obviously just flaunting it. I don't even need to grow it anymore. I'm just going to like cut some of it off. Thanks, Edo. For that, yeah, I'll be interested to see how the um, hero's welcome kind of comes to pass. Let's talk about Robotech, though. How okay. do you play it? How do you play it? What's the mechanics? What's the basis? Is there little miniatures in it? You know, what? Just the message. What's the message, Dave? Tell me. So when we did, so we 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 built the original Force of Arms game, which was a light. You had a you had a center grid of capital spaceships, and then you would build mm. um, face down fighters around the outside of the grid, either attack or defense, building vectors of attack and defense across the grid. So where your cards meet over a certain ship would determine how much power you had. So we took that the the Force of Arms, which is is, is in stores. It's a twenty dollar game. It's nice and light. It's a, it's an introductory. We 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 kept the mechanics from being overly complex because you know Robotech is known but not known. It's you know it's not Star Wars, it's not Star Trek, but the people who know it love it. And the people we wanted something that was light enough for people to get introduced to the art and and the sense of awesome that is Robotech itself. And so when we went to Crisis Point, we moved on. So the TV show was originally Macross. Uh, the Masters and New Gen. So when we decided to make three games, each game is based in a section of the TV show so that it, once you have all three games, you can literally play the TV show. Um, yeah. So this middle one was Crisis Point, which is the Masters, and it really needed to feel like Ground War. So to evolve the game, you have a 4x4 four four grid in the center. Each player is going to end up playing eight cards to, to the middle out of an 11-card yeah. selection that they have. But as they do it, they will play cards around the outside. Um, and where those cards meet determines how much force of energy is over each card in the grid. What we did to evolve the game is as you play cards in the middle, you play them face up, and each card is different. Each card has a different uh, value and attack tokens. It also has a different triggerable ability. Some cards can trigger off of each other. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're building a ground war in the center by playing, you know, playing eight cards. The other guy plays eight cards and you're building, you know, your combat units around the outside to determine, do I protect how many of my, my units did I protect and how many of my enemy units did I destroy? And it's, it's, you know, it's four phases. You, you do the tactical, which is I play a card and I play a, and I play a combat card around the outside face down. You go, we go back and forth for eight turns and then any tokens we've collected, you just you, you can play them two at a time in the center, try to modify how the center functions. And then you go to the hero and command phase, which is you have a selection of heroes and commands that are the heroes are famous heroes from the show. Commands are famous events or things that happened during the show that we turned into a, a command. And when you play those cards, they tend to manipulate the center even farther. So mm. when you're playing earlier in the game, you have to kind of plan ahead for your hero and command phase because 
there are certain cards that if you play, if you have the center arranged the right way, the effect of the hero command card is even stronger potentially than you know it could be if you combo the cards out right. So it's it's a ta- we what we said is we describe it as area control plus bluffing plus resource management plus tactical and strategy planning. So it's, it's got all these little bits flying together so that you've got to really think your way through just like just like if you were really having a ground war and one of the things the fan base really wanted because masters tends to be the redheaded stepchild of robotech in a lot of ways either you hate it yeah. or you love it there's no middle ground with with the masters and so we we went out to the fan base for the masters and we really leaned into finding they said, please make it feel like a ground war because that's what it was and, and, and like a war game almost. And so we, we found a middle ground that worked. And it is. You're, you're deploying forces in the center. You're deploying forces around the outside. You flip it all over and determine who captured the most victory points in units. You know, you're, if you protect yours, you get victory points for that. And if you destroy the other guys, you get victory points for that. Um, we added some secret objectives so that there's – you know, hidden things that you're trying to accomplish during the course of the quote war while you're fighting. And, and it, it comes down to, it. it's a nice two player game it takes about 50, 40 to 50 minutes. And it's pretty deep. It's got some pretty, pretty intense strategy. And the more you play it, the more that it's like kind of in a way, like playing magic, the gathering, and the more, you know, the cards and the more different ways you can figure out how to make them bounce off of each other. This, this has a similar it's nowhere near as deep or broad as obviously magic, but it's got that feel of, wow, I could, I might be able to come up with a strategy nobody's ever seen before. If I put these cards here and then trigger these other two cards. Mm. And that's what we wanted. We wanted people to really feel like they were running one side of a war and it, and it came out really nice. Is it with you, you know, with you being able to, to have the license, is it tempting to kind of create, stuff just for the sake of using everything that's involved with the license as in you know making a car be a game but saying hey look at this six inch high mini that you can get with it as well do you have to be quite conservative and and take into account like the costs of you know putting together the game and making sure you're kind of i guess just you know um giving it what it's due what it deserves in terms of you know putting the kind of game out there, but kind of holding back enough so it doesn't look like it's kind of like, oh, we're, we're doing a cash grab. Here. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the things that's, you know, we actually worked on a doing a miniatures game at one point, but what we had discovered at one point was, you know, my fan base is, you know, not about miniatures and $80, you know, games and, and things like that. So we, we, what I do and how I approach things is, if I, I look at my games as if I'm a consumer and I'm like, okay, did every, is the box the right size? You know, did I, it, I don't want to have a lot of empty space in it. Am I throwing things in just to throw things in? Don't do that. I wanted mm-hmm. to make sure all of, when I approach the design for my games, I don't put anything in it that isn't absolutely necessary because I want to keep the price down. I want to keep it accessible to as many people as possible. Um, we've had a lot of people say that, you know, Force of Armor should have been 25 and Crisis Point should have been 35, but we did 20 and 30 because it's it that $5, I don't feel the need to charge people $5 to help compensate for what I paid for the license because I would yeah. rather have more people have it than make more money, so to speak, because it, it is, once again, it's, you know, my friend teases me he goes you're a horrible businessman but you're a great game maker because it's i don't want to squeeze every dollar out and and so one of the things we do as a company i say we it's me um we may not put a lot of extra uh, stuff or tchotchke in the game but one thing yeah. about all of our games they're beautiful i i will spend extra money i've been using the same artist for several games and for me the game has to be beautiful. The, the art has to be pop and look gorgeous. And like one of the most beautiful things we ever made was Lords of Rock. Um, the, the, art, the gods look amazing in the game and it's one of the things people love. But the, it all had a purpose. The, there's a reason the art is there. We didn't make art for art's sake. But if I'm going to put art in a game, I'm going to invest in making it the best I can find and not cheap off on something because if it's going to be laying on the table for a long time and you'll be looking at it for a long time, I want it to be, I want it to be attractive. I want it to be, you know, you can see that there was love that went into 
the vision that you're getting to see. Yeah, yeah. What um, where are you in the kind of the the the, the kind of the time scales at the moment? Because as obviously what we said at the beginning, you've got the ability to go in and kind of um do the pre order on it. Mm-hmm. So everything's ready to go. You know, it's all in, you, you said it's like it's almost as a, in production at the moment. Um, the, yeah, it's in uh, it's actively being manufactured. We got the production samples last week while I was at Gamma. So we were able to show people um, what it looks like. I mean, it's 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 all signed off. They, they're they beginning. They're ramping up to start production. Um, uh, we're doing the pre-sale right now. Um, like I said, we have some custom limited edition Robotech extras that don't cost any extras. So people who want to get in early, get a little something extra that they can only get from the pre-order from me personally. Um, but we expect to have the product arrive in the U S um, just depending on customs in the boat. Always. There's always that caveat late hmm. May and it'll be in, it should be in stores in June um, and then we will be at Origins Game Fair uh, mid June, and we'll have a. It's kind of going to be our coming out launching party. We'll have a bunch of the, we'll have Force Arms with us. We'll have Crisis Point with us, and then for people who mm-hmm. come see us at Origins, we're actually going to have a prototype for Invid Invasion so they can see it. And um, in terms of kind of like, um, I'm just looking because I am kind of captivated. I am a big sucker mm-hmm. for kind of like the the art kind of things um in terms of having like a retail tail on this are you actively looking at courting kind of distribution places as well i mean is this going to be hitting kind of retail shelves as well oh yeah i'm i'm actually i've signed with a distributor i have been for two years now so the Uh pre-sale is just it's just so we could move so we can move some of the special things we made um, mm. and generate some capital for the art and stuff we're already investing in for Invid Invasion. So it's it's one of those where we're trying to, for the big fans, give them, give them an opportunity, give them a little something extra. And then um, people who get um, GTM Magazine and things like that, it'll be any distributor that anybody has when June comes, if they go to their store, I think our SKU code is SRF, 0602 for crisis mm. point it's 0600 for force of arms you'll be able to go into a store and just ask for it and they'll, they should be able to either they'll be carrying it or they'll um they'll have it for you um and one of the things we are doing is at the time that crisis point hits stores we created a little booster pack um called the grand cannon booster um that actually goes with force of arms we made it free we made um we made uh, over 8,000 copies of it. Uh, it's a little six card booster. Every retailer on the planet will be able to order it for free and then give it to fans who've purchased force of arms or go to buy force of arms. They'll get it for free. The store shouldn't charge them for it. It doesn't cost the store anything, but it adds value to force of arms at the same time we're releasing crisis point. And then later this year, when we do the pre-order for Invid invasion, we're actually going to release a 23 card booster pack for free again so that you can take force of arms and crisis point and set them side by side and play two two player games as a single four player game as the two games will be able to enter with the with the extra cards they'll be able to interact with each other so we're we're a big believer in putting out a little something to support game stores so that they have something yeah. nice and extra and that fans if you if you like the first one and you come back for the second one we're going to make a little something extra for you for the first one, you know, and, and it's about, you know, it's about, you know, doing that fan service and caring about, caring about what you're making beyond, you know, what dollars you're making, if that makes any sense. No, I mean, it's certainly coming across just a tiny little bit in the way <laughs> you're talking, you know, just getting an impression. I'm not really good at picking up kind of subtleties and stuff like that, but you're definitely, <laughs> I'm I'm getting a hint that you actually like what you're doing, which no, I mean in all seriousness, I mean it goes back to the point that we made about, you know, taking a group of models, sticking a different color paint on them and saying, Oh look, here's the latest kind of XYZ game. You know, it's always a concern whenever I see um IPs on Kickstarters that sometimes the 
the game, the IP and the the fact that they're making minis for the game and the fact that, you know, that kind of outweighs potentially what the game plays going to be, mm-hmm. you know. So it's to hear somebody that's kind of like, you obviously love what you're doing, um, kind of adds that, just that little bit of, I guess, confidence to anybody that's considering kind of jumping in and, and having a, you know, having you know, having a flutter or, <laughs> or having a try on the game. Oh, well, and that's um, one of the things with like Invid Invasion. When we put it out next year, it's gonna be it's gonna be a fifty dollar game because it's got a twenty four inch by thirty six inch board in it. And then people are like, "Well, did you put minis in it?" I mean, we could have if we wanted to, but then uh-huh. instead of being a fifty dollar game, it would be an eighty or a hundred dollar game, and all the all the minis would do would be show your place on the board they, they, to me that that's when you asked me that question earlier about, Hey, you putting stuff in there just to put it in there. Well, for mm. me, it was a better choice to take the beautiful art that we're making and make, you know, five standees for each of the characters you can play instead of trying to make five yeah. minis for each character when the minis don't I mean, minis wouldn't to me wouldn't add enough value over standees to make up the cost difference I'm charging somebody. I would have just felt bad. And they don't reflect on the sto- on the source material as well. Considering the original the original IP is a cartoon. Yes. You know, a standee a standee makes f- much more sense, a beautiful coloured standee than an awkward looking three kind of three D model where people are saying I don't think their face should look like that. <laughs> yeah. Kind of that is not how they... No, I don't know about the nose and the big eyes. I'm not yes. kind of sure that they should look like that from that kind of angle. Um, In terms of, you know, if people have listened along tonight and they want, they've like went, right, okay. Um, You know, you, you, know, you have my interest, but now you have my attention. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't even know why I said that. Um. Probably because I saw that poster today on Twitter. But anyway, um, if they want to find out and they want to get hold of a copy, um, where do you exist on the internet webs? So for us, we are at um, Um, Mm solarflaregames.com. We're at facebook.com slash solarflaregames. Twitter is, this is is the part that's weird, we're at Brave Frontier because my actual LLC is Brave Frontier Studios. But... Um, and okay. then Instagram.com slash Solarflare Games. Uh, and if they want to go check out the pre-order, pretty much they should be able to find a link in any of those places. But we also made mm-hmm. um, a tiny URL. So if you go to uh, tinyurl.com slash crisis point, you'll be able to go to the pre-order page. Cool. Cool. We'll make sure that we put all of the links in the show notes so that we've got notes to show. Cool. Um, if you If you want to keep an eye on what we're up to, just go to the internet and search for We're Not Wizards. You know, we've done 260 odd of these episodes if you don't know where we are now. But in case you are wondering, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and the blog, which is we're not wizards.blogspot.com and the website, which is we're not wizards.com. And you can find us on all these fabulous podcast catchers like Stitcher and Spreaker and Acast and Podknife and Podbean and anything that's got the word cast in it and anything that's got the word pod in it. Basically, Spotify. That's not got word pod or cast in it, is it? That's rubbish. Anyway, but um, if you want to um, kind of st- stick around, hang around with us, you know, keep on listening to us, jump over to Apple Podcasts, drop us a subscription, drop us a rating, drop us a review. If you want to drop us a rating or review, don't give us 10 stars. Makes me big headed. Don't give me one. Don't give us one star. This makes me cry. And as I keep on saying, I'm not getting any younger. And the tracks of the tears that roll down my face just add even more lines of bitterness and <laughs> ugliness into this visage that you see before you. So give us a five. Because it's in the middle. It's average. Just a little bit average, you know. But the person who's not been average is rather wonderful, rather fantastic. Mr. Dave Killingsworth. Um, thank you very, very much for coming on, sir. Um, it's really kind of it's good to hear things are going so well for you. It's exciting to hear about the campaign. It's also exciting to hear how excited you are about working with like the Robotech IP as well. It's pretty cool. 
Um, so thank you very, very much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Uh, there's only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we are many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Dave? We are not wizards. Fantastic. And the second thing is to say goodbye. So it's a goodbye from Dave. Say goodbye, Dave. Goodbye, Dave. And it's everybody start yeah, every single time without fail. And you know what? I'm starting to like it. But and it's a good You're asking goodbye. for it when you do that. I that. You know, there's a whole this whole thing is scripted. It'd be you know, a lot funnier if I just said goodbye, Bob, and confused you. <laughs> I, I'm very, very easy to confuse. <laughs> um, and it's a goodbye, see, just like there. And it's a goodbye from me, remember, stay safe, roll sixes. And um, <laughs> you ain't getting tech unless it's Robotech. <laughs> but, yeah, check out, you know, check out the links. You know, you, you guys love card games. I know you do. Um, and you love robots and you love 1980s cartoons. What is there not to like? But until the next time, goodbye. A wizard is never late. Nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to.